this year. Thank you. That concludes general questions. We move on to First Minister's questions. And at question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This week's health figures revealed that more people are waiting longer than ever for emergency treatment. Across Scotland over the last week, nearly 10,000 people waited more than the target four hours at accident and emergency departments. That's the worst waiting times on record, and it's only September. Our doctors, our nurses and staff are doing outstanding work, but we know the pressures on our NHS only get worse over the winter. So, First Minister, what action is your government taking now to reduce the time that people are waiting for emergency treatment here in Scotland? First Minister. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. As the Health Secretary uh, said earlier this week, uh, the most recent performance in accident emergency is not good enough. And I am very clear about the need for improvement. Uh, the most recent performance, of course, does reflect the very significant pressure across health and social care, uh, arising obviously from the two-year pandemic, but also from some pre-existing factors, the changing demographics uh, of our country, for example. Uh, so there is uh, a very sharp focus on uh, doing what requires to be done to improve that performance. So that takes me to the specific question. In addition to what has been a 263% increase in accident and emergency consultants since this government took office. We are uh, firstly investing more to support further uh, recruitment, uh, overseas recruitment included, uh, and we're taking action through the £50 million pounds urgent and unscheduled care collaborative. That work includes a range of different strands uh, offering alternatives to hospital where that's appropriate, such as hospital at home, uh, directing people where appropriate uh, to better urgent care uh, settings um, and scheduling some urgent appointments to avoid long waits in accident and emergency. Uh, the Chief Operating Officer of the NHS uh, also wrote to health boards this week with five additional specific actions uh, that we are expecting health boards uh, to take. So we do expect to see improvement and we want to see uh, that improvement starting to be visible immediately. Final point I, I would make, presiding officer, is for the sake of those working so hard on our uh, National Health Service, to put this into uh, context. Our NHS is facing uh, these significant pressures, but the NHS in every part of the UK is doing so as well. And while performance needs to improve here in Scotland, our accident and emergency departments are performing better than those in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. So for context, because it is important to put it in context, if we look at the last complete month uh, where we have figures, uh, performance against the four-hour target in Scotland was 66.5%, not good enough and it needs to improve, but that compares to 57% in England, 55.2% uh, in Wales, and 45.7% in Northern Ireland. So these pressures exist everywhere. This government is focused on making sure we support those in our health service to tackle them. Douglas Ross. Context may be important for the First Minister and her members behind her, but for people waiting hours and days for a and &E treatment, they are hollow words. We are now more than a year into the Health Secretary's recovery plan, but the situation is getting worse, not better. The First Minister spoke about a &E consultants, but here's what doctors on the front line are saying. The Deputy Chair of BME Scotland said this week, as an a &E doctor, I often tell people that a &E is a safe space. You can come here if you're in pain, if you're sore, if you don't know where to go. But Dr Peel continued, our a &E departments are no longer safe. And what's really concerning is our government just aren't acting and they're turning a blind eye to this. A new information that we've uncovered shows just how horrendous waiting times are in Scottish hospitals just now. An FOI response has revealed that one patient at a hospital in Ayrshire had to wait 84 hours for treatment. That's three and a half days. The equivalent of turning up for emergency treatment right now and not being seen until next week in the early hours of Monday morning. First Minister, is that really what anyone in Scotland should go through in 2022? First Minister. No, and that, that is 
clearly a, an unacceptable situation, but also an exceptional situation. And I am certainly more than willing to look into the particular circumstances around that. Um, I have been very clear, uh, firstly, that the current performance is, is not acceptable. Um, I would uh, not and do not shy away from uh, saying that. Uh, secondly, I have been very clear about the action the government is taking to support those on the front line to ensure that there is much speedier access uh, to uh, accident and emergency and uh, to healthcare services uh, more generally. Um, and uh, also to make the important contextual points, because this is part of giving confidence to people uh, that we are taking action uh, to address this. So in terms of performance against the four hour uh, waiting time target, not good enough, uh, but better than uh, in counterpart parts of the United Kingdom. And uh, again, in terms of uh, long waits, 12-hour waits are 50 times uh, more in England uh, than they are uh, in Scotland, uh, four times higher in Wales than in Scotland. That does not mean that performance in Scotland is good enough. Uh, but Douglas Ross and others often come to this chamber and somehow pretend or suggest that these issues are unique to Scotland. They are not unique to Scotland. Uh, they are pressures that all health services are facing and I am setting out uh, rightly the action we are taking to support the health service in tackling these. So in terms of recruitment, in terms of investment, in terms of changing the pathways of care to make sure that people not only get speedier access but access the right part of the health service at the right time, uh, we are taking action across uh, all of these strands and will continue to, to do so. Douglas Ross. Unbelievably, the, the First Minister just said there that 84 hours is not good enough, but it's better than other parts of the United Kingdom. How, how does that person, how does the person who was waiting for 84 hours feel when they hear that? Their friends and family. And while that was the most extreme example that we found, it's not the only time that someone has waited four days at A&E. Our FOI responses reveal that another patient waited 79 hours earlier this year, another 66 hours, and another 53 hours. There are thousands waiting each week for longer than the government's target time. A constituent wrote to us about their grandmother, and this is what they said. My nana took a turn for the worse last week and could not stop vomiting. Due to her type 2 diabetes and blood pressure, this is a very serious condition indeed. She was admitted to hospital after a lengthy wait and then sent home. This happened several times over a number of days. Finally, she had to be rushed to A&E and her grandson told us this. What I was faced with was utter chaos. I felt so sorry for the doctors and the nurses and helpers. They were literally at breaking point. There were beds and people everywhere. I wish I had taken a picture, but the image is etched in my memory forever. The beds were wall to wall, and my nana had to stay in her mobility chair as there was nowhere for her to go. First Minister, this can't go on any longer, and it certainly can't go on through the winter. So when will people in Scotland get access to emergency treatment that they deserve when they need it? First Minister. Well, as I said earlier on, uh, we expect to see um, and we are supporting uh, what it will take to deliver immediate improvements in accident and emergency waiting times. These are really serious issues. As uh, the, one, the case uh, that Douglas Ross has narrated today uh, illustrates, and uh, I would not say otherwise, but it doesn't do anybody uh, any service at all uh, to deliberately, deliberately twist uh, and indeed misrepresent what I said Absolutely. in my previous answer. Yes. I did not say, and it's really important to be clear here, uh, that 84 hours was not good enough but better than anywhere else in the UK. I, I said our four-hour performance was not good enough but better than other parts of the UK. And I said that our longer wait performance was too. What I said about 84 hours was that that is clearly unacceptable. But cases like that are also exceptional. And it's important that where cases like that do occur, uh, they are properly looked into. 
Um, in terms of our performance against the 12-hour target, um, in the most recent week, very challenging, the lowest four-hour performance on record, and it's important to be clear about that, but more than nine out of 10, 95.4% of patients were seen within that 12-hour uh, target. So clearly exceptional cases shouldn't happen, and when they do, lessons should be learned. Uh, but it is important not to misrepresent uh, the situation or to misrepresent what I said. In terms of the action we are taking, because that is uh, what obviously matters, I have referred to support for recruitment. And it is important to point out to the 263% increase in a and &E consultants. Uh, we're also investing £11 million to support further domestic and international recruitment. And of course, international recruitment has been made significantly harder uh, because of uh, Brexit. And I'll just put that on record. Uh, it also includes a thousand healthcare support workers that were brought in over uh, last uh, winter. Uh, and the £50 million investment that I've already uh, referenced, looking at alternatives to accident emergency where that is more appropriate for patients. So we'll continue to focus on improving this performance. And uh, to end this answer where I started, we do expect to see uh, performance improve immediately. Douglas Shaws. We've been told this before, there's going to be immediate improvements and then people are waiting 84, 79, 66, 59 hours. And, and the First Minister says these are exceptional cases. So let me give her another one because there are just so many. We spoke to another patient who attended Monklands Hospital. She was stuck at A&E again and again and again waiting for emergency treatment. She went to A&E with severe abdominal pains. She was left waiting, vomiting, in extreme pain for nine hours. She was told to come back the next day at 9am. This time, she waited a further six hours. Two days later, her condition had worsened to the point that her GP told her to go back to A&E for urgent treatment. On this occasion, she again waited nine hours. That's a total of 24 hours waiting for emergency treatment in just four days all in extreme pain. So she wants to ask one simple question to the First Minister. How can you allow this to continue? First Minister, we're not um, allowing this to continue. Uh, we are recognising uh, the significant pressures on our National Health Service. Um, and let me say, uh, an experience like that is completely unacceptable. Uh, but there are significant pressures on our National Health Service and significant action being taken to address those pressures. And we will continue uh, to take those steps around recruitment, investment and redesigning pathways of care. I don't know uh, whether it is the case um, in the particular instance that Douglas Ross has uh, just narrated, but there will be many people who end up in accident and emergency departments who would be better seen and treated in other parts of our National Health Service. Um, uh, that, 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 that's why I said I didn't know if that was the case in that particular instance. But there are many people who would be better treated in other ways. That's why uh, we are investing in hospital at home, in uh, different urgent care settings, um, and in scheduling urgent appointments in A&E so that people don't have to have long waits. Uh, this work uh, does take time. Uh, this work uh, requires that investment in recruitment that I have spoken about, uh, but that is why the Health Secretary and the Government is focused on making sure we do it and support those at the front line of our health service as they support patients who need treatment on the National Health Service. Thank you. Question number two, Anna Sarwar. Thank you, Presiding Officer. On the 25th of August 2021, the First Minister announced her NHS catch-up plan. Can she tell the Chamber how many people were on an NHS waiting list then and 13 months on, how many are on an NHS waiting list now? First Minister. Uh, waiting lists and waiting times have increased since then. The figures are published, so they are there for people to see, and uh, I'm sure Anna Sarwar uh, will quote the published figures uh, at me. Uh, of course, since then, uh, we have also had further waves uh, of COVID. The pr pressure on our National Health Service here and in other uh, parts of the country continues, uh, but we are focused through the recovery plan uh, on treating the most urgent patients and, of course, uh, treating uh, the longest waits. And just this morning, uh, information has been published uh, about performance against the, the target to eradicate in most specialties uh, those waiting two years or more. So we are seeing progress, but this is an extremely challenging time for the National Health Service, which is why it is so important that we continue to focus on the investment and the action that we are taking. 
Anasawa. Catch-up surely means waiting lists come down rather than go up. And 603,000 was the number waiting in August 2021, and nearly 750,000 people are on one now, 14 months on after our so-called catch-up plan. And the First Minister stopped pretending this is all down to COVID. When the SNP came to power, there were 260,000 people on NHS waiting lists. Immediately before COVID, there were 420,000 people on NHS waiting lists. Now it's three quarters of a million people. That's now one in seven Scots on an NHS waiting list. And this has consequences. Listen to the staff. Dr Leila Peel from the BMA said this week that patients are now presenting at A&E because of complications developed while waiting for treatment and scans. Week after week, this government has been breaking records for the worst A&E waiting times ever. So, First Minister, can you tell us how many people have waited over 12 hours for A&E treatment since you launched your so-called NHS recovery plan? First Minister, I've obviously just covered the situation in accident emergency. Those waiting uh, over uh, 12 hours uh, has increased, but more than 95 per cent of patients um, are seen in accident emergency uh, within 12 hours. Of course, the target we want to meet in accident emergency is the four-hour uh, waiting time target. Um, in terms of waiting times uh, more generally, uh, yes, waiting times uh, have been increasing. Uh, there has been a two-year pandemic uh, that has had a significant impact uh, on waiting times in our National Health Service. Uh, but as I said, I think in response to a question earlier on, of course there are other factors uh, that were pre-existing, the changing demographics of the country being uh, one of those. Uh, over the last two months, there has been a focus on treating the longest wait, the longest waits in our National Health Service, and the figures uh, published today show the progress in uh, that. Uh, we're also seeing an increase in the number of inpatient and day case patients who have been seen. So in the uh, most recent quarter, uh, a 7.6% increase in those seen, uh, which demonstrates the recovery of the NHS uh, from COVID. So these are, are difficult challenges. Uh, there is absolutely no getting away from that. Almost every country, certainly every country in the UK and most countries across the world are grappling with these challenges. Uh, but the investment uh, that we see in our National Health Service and the steps that we are taking to redesign care uh, are what need uh, to continue. And lastly, uh, we do listen uh, to staff. The Health Secretary meets uh, with staff and with unions and professional organisations on a regular basis. And of course, there are many more staff working in our National Health Service today than was the case uh, when this government took office. I think more than 20,000 uh, additional staff have been recruited in that period. Anna Sarwar. Uh, they might listen to staff. He's not hearing what the staff are telling him and taking the necessary action to help people across the country. In terms of the actual question I asked the First Minister, uh, the answer she was looking for is 38,255 people have waited more than 12 hours in A&E since the recovery plan was published. 38,255. And frankly, people are sick of the same old excuses and this SNP government always looking for someone else or something else to blame. Across Scotland, people are getting the same inadequate answer from this government. Wait. Wait in fear for a cancer diagnosis. Wait in pain for a hip replacement. Wait for hours in an ambulance outside A&E. Wait anxiously for their child to get mental health treatment. And today we discover that life expectancy has dropped again for a second year running, all under Nicola Sturgeon's watch. After 15 years in power, after 15 years of running our NHS, how long will the people of Scotland have to wait for you and your health secretary to do your job? Through the chair, please, Mr Sarwar, First Minister. Um, we'll continue to do our jobs and ultimately, as it always has been, it is for the people of Scotland to decide whether they want to, us to continue uh, to do our jobs. Uh, a two-year pandemic uh, for Scotland, for every country, has presented uh, real and very significant challenges and every day uh, we seek to address these challenges and support those on the front line uh, who are doing that. We will continue to do that in our NHS. We will continue to take uh, the action, albeit uh, in this regard, with one hand tied behind our back to tackle poverty in Scotland, uh, to have uh, a positive impact on things like life expectancy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Unfortunately, Labour still wants us to have one hand tied behind our back on these issues. And, and while, 
I take full responsibility uh, for performance across all of these things in Scotland. Come back to the reality uh, in Scotland in terms of the National Health Service, that whatever the challenges we face, uh, thanks to the dedication of those working in our National Health Service, it is performing better uh, than its counterpart in England, where the Conservatives are in power, and better than its counterpart in Wales, where Labour are currently in government. So we'll continue to address these challenges, we'll continue to take the steps necessary to do so, uh, and we'll continue uh, to ask the Scottish people to put their trust in us to do exactly that. Now move to constituency and general supplementaries, and I call Bill Kidd. Thank you very much, President Officer. Um, September is Blood Cancer Awareness Week, which provides an opportunity to increase awareness of the importance of new people joining the anti nonolan stem cell register. Simple act of a swab test could lead to the selfless act of saving a life. Will the First Minister join me in encouraging young people aged 16 to 30, especially young men from ethnic minority backgrounds, to consider joining the Stem Cell Register and thank Anthony Nolan and the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service for their continued efforts in raising this issue in schools up and down the country? First Minister. Yes, I'm very happy to uh, do so and uh, I'm grateful to Bill Kidd for raising uh, this important issue. I will join him in encouraging all those eligible to consider joining the stem cell register. Anthony Nolan research has shown that the younger the donor, the better the patient's chance of survival. Uh, and as has been pointed out, those between age 16 to 30 can join the stem cell register. Uh, and uh, additionally, I would like to acknowledge and indeed thank the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service's 13-year partnership with Anthony Nolan for their continued hard work in raising awareness around this issue. Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, a recent report by Public Health Scotland has found that suicide amongst young Scots to be the leading cause of death. Ministers have described every suicide as being a tragedy and that suicide prevention is the key priority for the Scottish Government. Therefore, First Minister, given that priority, what action is being taken to put in place to ensure youngsters affected by suicide get the access they require to reduce this appalling situation? First Minister. Every suicide is a tragedy, and obviously we want to take and support steps uh, to reduce the number of suicides in Scotland. Uh, I would say, though, uh, that not trying to take anything away from the very important issue that has been raised, uh, thankfully the number of suicide deaths by young people has decreased over the past two years. Uh, the Public Health Scotland report earlier this week tells us uh, that the average uh, rate from 2011 to 2020 um, amongst the under 24s uh, was lower uh, than the rate amongst those aged 25 and over, but it is still uh, way uh, too high. So our new Suicide uh, Prevention Youth Advisory Group will help shape the approach to suicide prevention for children and young people. Uh, here, of course, uh, the wider work uh, around mental health support for young people is important as well, uh, and encouraging uh, those to access support earlier rather than later and making sure the services are there for them when they do. Carol Mocken. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Recent UCAS figures shockingly highlight a shortfall of almost 1,000 in the actual number of students currently accepted into nursing and midwifery courses in Scotland compared to the government's own recommended intake for 2022-23. I saw firsthand last week in my south of Scotland region the impact shortages are having on our Ayrshire hospitals and the well-being of the staff. What we need is a clear plan for making nursing and midwifery an appealing career for young people to address the figures the RCN describe as extremely worrying for nursing. So I ask the First Minister today, when will her government stop patting itself on the back, realise the scale of this recruitment problem and outline detailed action it will take to address this problem? First Minister. Again, in Addressing an important issue, I think it's important that it is not misrepresented, and I know the member wouldn't want to do that. So let me um, address in some detail the issue of uh, nurse and midwifery student numbers. The target intake for this year is 4,837. So far, and I stress so far, and I'll come back to that point, uh, there have been 3,850 
uh, students accepted onto nursing courses and 280 uh, onto midwifery uh, courses. So that's 4,120. So it's not a shortfall. I don't think it's a shortfall at all for a reason I'll come on to. Uh, but there are 700, around 700 uh, places yet to be filled, uh, not 1,000. Uh, but the reason I say so far is because this is a clearing process that has not yet completed. It is still underway and final numbers uh, won't be known until the end of the cycle in December. Uh, but even so, uh, compared to 2019, uh, the figures so far uh, are 5% up in terms of acceptances for nursing places and 7% up in terms of midwifery places. And again, for context, because I think context is also important, the number of nursing acceptances in Wales over the same period is down by 17%. So this cycle is not yet complete. But I think there is much to be encouraged about. And perhaps, Thank you. Presiding Officer, Thank you. perhaps, Presiding Officer, one of the reasons is that we have increased the nursing and midwifery student bursary to £10,000. That's higher than it is anywhere else in the UK. And we also have more qualified uh, nurses and midwives per head of population than any other part of the UK as well. So challenges, yes. Uh, but clearly, and this has just been evidenced, <coughs> action being taken to address those challenges. Alistair Allen. <laughs> Alistair Allen. Uh, the Tories seem to have conceded that a trade deal with the USA was yet another effort to delude themselves and deceive others on the merits of Brexit. Meanwhile, former Scotland Food and Drink Chief Executive James Withers recently stated that the UK is suffering from an ongoing malaise. This is long Brexit and we're all living with it. Does the First Minister support this view and agree that the renormalisation of relations with our European friends uh, is the only way to ensure that Scotland's world-class food and drink industry does not continue to be hamstrung by UK uh, mismanagement? First Minister. Um, there's no doubt at all that the food and drink sector in Scotland, indeed across the UK, has borne the brunt of the hard Brexit pursued by the UK Tory uh, government, particularly through the loss of free trade and free movement of people. Uh, we know that Scotland's food exports to the EU in 2021 were down by £70 million compared to 2019, and that is clearly down to the reckless Brexit uh, that the UK government has pursued. Uh, so, given that they've had to admit uh, this week that there's no trade deal with the United States on the horizon, I think the least the UK government can now do is to stop threatening a trade war with the European Union in the middle of a cost of living crisis. Brexit uh, was not in the interests of Scotland uh, and further exacerbating trade tensions with the EU would certainly not be in the interests of Scotland or anybody else across the United Kingdom. Miles Briggs. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Campaigners were heartened when the First Minister signalled that the Scottish Government will take forward a formal apology to those affected by forced adoption. Monica Lennon and myself have met with Ministers to try to progress this issue, but progress has been limited. For many campaigners, time is simply running out. So can I ask the First Minister a very straightforward question? Will she today commit to take forward that national apology before the end of this year? First Minister. The, the commitments that we uh, have made, the, the commitments that I have made, I, I think in this chamber uh, still stand. I understand the importance of this issue and understand the great sensitivity of this issue. It is important, though, that we properly think through and work through uh, all of the, the various issues, the, the legal issues that are inevitably involved in this, uh, but also uh, give careful thought uh, to the, the framing and the wording uh, of an apology. Um, this is an important issue, so uh, rather uh, than give an update uh, right now, what I will do is uh, ask officials uh, or the relevant minister to write uh, to the member to put this in spice, uh, giving a more detailed update on the work that has been done uh, and the progress that is being made. Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Just last year, Scottish Government funding of £4.8 million was awarded to Dumfrieshire-based Alpha Solway to build a manufacturing plant in Dumfries for PPE, with a promise from ministers of 300 jobs. Today, that firm employs fewer than half that number and has just begun a consultation on further job losses, in the firm's words, due to NHS orders being stopped. Now, of course, the overall level of PPE we need may well have been reduced, but surely one of the lessons 
of the pandemic is that never again should we rely on import and PPE. It should be manufactured here in Scotland. That presumably was the view of the government when it awarded this funding. So will the First Minister urgently investigate the government's approach to the purchase of PPE and the stopping of NHS orders so we can further avoid any further job losses at Alpha Solway and ensure we have that vital future resilience when it comes to PPE? First Minister. Well, firstly, uh, during the pandemic, uh, we did build a resilient uh, PPE manufacturing sector in Scotland. I think that is important, and I think it is important that we maintain that, uh, of course, to reduce any dependence on imported PPE in future. Um, it is the case, though, and um, I think the member has referenced this in his question, that demand for PPE has understandably slowed considerably between the peak of the pandemic and current demand, uh, meaning that procurement requirements have reduced. So work is continuing to implement a new approach to pandemic PPE and learn uh, fully the lessons uh, from COVID. In terms of Alpha Solway, it is uh, one of our partners and we very much appreciate the important contribution that company made uh, during the pandemic. Um, I know this is a concerning time for the company staff. The business minister has spoken with the company though and offered the full support of Scottish Government and South of Scotland Enterprise. Uh, South of Scotland Enterprise in particular is engaging with the company to explore all options and will offer any assistance that might be required. And I'll ask the business minister uh, to keep the member fully up updated on progress. Question number three, Alex Cole-Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I refer the Chamber to my register of interest as a member of the Homes for Ukraine scheme to ask the First Minister when the Scottish Government will announce the outcome of its review into the pausing of the super sponsor scheme for Ukrainian refugees coming to Scotland. First Minister. Uh, firstly, President Officer, uh, can I report to Parliament that more, more than 18,000 displaced Ukrainians are uh, currently being accommodated in Scotland. Uh, this is almost 20% of the total number in the UK. It includes almost 15,000 under the Scottish Government's super sponsor uh, scheme, and that compares to our initial commitment of 3,000. So I think this is something uh, for everyone across Scotland to be very proud of, and it is, of course, an important part of our overall contribution uh, to supporting and helping Ukraine in this hour of need. Uh, we are currently reviewing the operation of the sponsor programme and the Warm Scottish Welcome to ensure that we can provide appropriate and sustainable uh, longer term support to those here as well as to those still arriving and those due to travel. I can also confirm today that we are providing a dedicated capital fund of up to £50 million which will be available for registered social landlords to help bring sustainable accommodation into use and boost the housing supply for those fleeing conflict in Ukraine. Alex Cole Hamilton. I'm very grateful for that reply. The First Minister boasting about numbers will be of cold comfort to those who have been living out of suitcases since February or are coming to the end of placements with no idea what happens next. This isn't a new life, this is a new limbo. Furthermore, the mobilisations in Russia, the pretend referendums, mean no chance of early return for our Ukrainian guests. A memo leaked to the Herald from the government's own rapid rehousing group has described confusion and increasing desperation. This government has written goodwill checks that refugees cannot cash. While it closed the scheme in July, it still hasn't acted on my call to reissue the appeal for homes. Additionally, presiding officer, we know that if it's easier to travel, it's easier to find homes and jobs. So can I also ask the First Minister, alongside the renewed call for homes, if she will now extend free bus travel to all refugees? First Minister. Well, firstly, those who uh, are being temporarily accommodated right now in Scotland, if they uh, weren't in temporary accommodation in Scotland, wouldn't have uh, refuge. Uh, so it is important that we do recognise that Scotland is more than playing our part. Uh, almost 20% now of all displaced Ukrainians in the UK are being accommodated here in Scotland. That is a good thing. It is good for Ukrainians, and I think it is good for Scotland to be playing yeah. that positive uh, part. Uh, we continue uh, to take the steps to ensure, of course, uh, that not just temporary accommodation is available, that longer term, more sustainable accommodation is uh, available. In terms of temporary accommodation, we continue to support uh, those who have offered uh, private homes uh, for use uh, and the matching process we continue to work to speed that up but it is important that we make longer term accommodation 
available, which is why the fund I've referenced today is an important part of that work. Uh, so we will continue uh, to take all of these steps to make sure that we are playing our part to continue to support Ukraine at this, what I think is a pivotal moment in the war, one where uh, we are all happy to see Ukraine in the ascendancy, uh, but continue to be concerned uh, about Putin and his intentions. So Scotland will continue to play our part, and I hope people across the chamber will give the Scottish Government, uh, our local authority uh, and third sector partners every support in doing so. Question number four, Cocap Stewart. I'd like to ask the First Minister whether she will provide an update on the Scottish Government's support for the people of Pakistan as they face ongoing devastation following severe monsoon flash flooding. First Minister. I think we've all been shocked and very concerned uh, by the devastating impacts of monsoon flooding in Pakistan, which includes the destruction uh, of or damage to 1.7 million homes. And this is a clear example of the loss and damage caused by climate change um, and underlines the need for all countries to act uh, on this. In terms of the immediate response, uh, we have made available £500,000 in humanitarian relief uh, funding. Uh, the Minister for International Development has also met with the Pakistan Consul General to hear firsthand uh, the situation on the ground and to offer Scotland's support on an ongoing basis. Co-Cap Stewart. I thank the First Minister for that update. Pakistanis across Scotland, um, including from her own constituency in Glasgow Southside and mine in Glasgow Kelvin, uh, will appreciate this update. Uh, I have previously welcomed to Parliament on behalf of the Education, Children and Young People's Committee a delegation from the regional government of Balochistan, one of the regions worst affected by the flooding. This week, the UNICEF Pakistan Chief Field Officer in Balochistan reported, we don't have enough food, shelter, health care. Roads and bridges have been washed away. The flood is not going anywhere. Will the First Minister commit to considering further support for Pakistan in the coming weeks, given the scale of this catastrophe and the ongoing havoc and misery that people are living through? First Minister. Uh, yes, uh, we will uh, absolutely uh, do that. Um, co Cap Stewart is also uh, right to point to her uh, constituency interest in this and, and to my own uh, constituency interest. A significant proportion of my constituents in Glasgow Southside are of Pakistani uh, origin and will have uh, relatives affected by the flooding. Uh, my constituency is also home to the Pakistan consulate. Um, so these uh, are issues that concern all of us um, and the scale of the devastation is truly overwhelming. 22,000 schools estimated to have been damaged, disrupting the education of an estimated three and a half million children. Uh, estimated material damage of up to $30 billion. 45% uh, of the country's agricultural land has been destroyed. The World Bank estimates that the floods could push 15 million people into poverty. Uh, and as the Prime Minister uh, has highlighted, uh, Prime Minister of Pakistan has highlighted, this is a, a clear case of climate injustice. Uh, so today, on the International Day of Recognition for Loss and Damage, uh, we also support his plea for urgent additional finance to address loss and damage. But Scotland will always do whatever we can to play our part in supporting countries affected by disasters such as this. Question number five, Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presenting Officer. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to support the transition to net zero heating in rural homes. First Minister. There are long-standing issues of poorer energy efficiency and higher fuel poverty in rural areas. That's why we provide more whole house retrofits and a wider range of support for installing zero emissions heating in rural areas. Overall, we have committed £1.8 billion for heat and energy efficiency over this parliament. That includes £42 million for Home Energy Scotland loans uh, with cashback scheme, £55 million for the Warmer Homes uh, Scotland scheme and £64 million for area-based schemes. We are committed to spending more per head on energy efficiency in remote rural areas where we know installation and labour costs are higher. The Home Energy Scotland service also provides free and partial advice on zero emissions heating and energy efficiency. Its five regional centres provide location-specific energy advice that takes account of rural circumstances and the varying energy demand of properties across the country. Brian Whittle. 
I thank the First Minister for that answer. Uh, earlier this year, a cross-party group of MSPs wrote to the Scottish Government highlighting the serious financial challenges facing off-gas grid homeowners seeking to replace their oil heating systems, which are increasingly expensive to run and carbon intensive. Despite the Scottish Government's much vaunted target of a million zero carbon heated homes by 2030, there is still no detailed plan on how it will be delivered, nor are the existing funding packages significant to meet, uh, sufficient to meet the costs these homeowners will face to install net zero heat. So does the First Minister recognise that any credible strategy should prioritise support for homes facing the costliest transition away from the most carbon intensive heating systems? First Minister. Um, yes, I do. I have set out uh, already some of the schemes uh, and the funding attached to those schemes uh, that are already in place uh, to help us meet the targets that Brian Whittle has referred to. Uh, I have already made clear uh, we recognise and uh, are responding, uh, of course, to the reality uh, that there are uh, deep issues of poorer energy efficiency and higher fuel poverty in rural areas. So I think uh, we are addressing these issues, but there is a big responsibility on us, as on all governments, to continue to do so. I was struck uh, by comments made uh, recently by the British Energy Efficiency Federation commenting specifically on Scottish Government policies on energy efficiency. I'll perhaps just uh, quote uh, these to give uh, some background. Uh, it said that the Scottish Government has deliberately concentrated such improvements in rural and remote communities not served by uh, the gas grid uh, and goes on to say no such set of activist programmes to stimulate energy efficiency yet exists from the UK Government. My advice to Whitehall is simple. You had best be copying Scotland's initiatives. Emma Roddick. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Communities across the Highlands and Islands are experiencing extreme fuel poverty, and many of these places also generate over 400% of their energy use through renewables. Will the Scottish Government consider extra support for homes in these areas which do not yet have or cannot be fitted with green he heating systems and are still using systems like LPG and oil boilers until they are able to be fitted with lower car carbon alternatives, given that these areas can already be considered net zero? First Minister. Uh, regulation uh, lies with the UK Government and uh, we have asked the UK Government to use its regulatory levers but within uh, the powers and resources uh, we have, as I have already uh, given some indication of, we will seek to do exactly that. We recognise uh, the very particular issues that do exist within rural areas and as part of our overall approach it is vital uh, that we address these appropriately. Rhoda Grant. The First Minister will be aware that her government only fit heat pumps under their central heating assistance scheme, and these are absolutely useless in drafty old houses. People who need help to replace and install central heating cannot afford to clad their homes with insulation. Will she therefore urgently amend the scheme to ensure that insulation is fitted in tandem with a heat pump central heating schemes to make sure that nobody is freezing this winter? First Minister. Uh, we will certainly look on an ongoing basis at uh, any adaptation or amendment to the rules around our existing schemes that, that might be required, and I'll ask uh, the relevant Minister to look particularly at this point and to write uh, to the member as soon as possible. Question number six, Pam Duncan Glancy. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the One Parent Family Scotland report, Living Without a Lifeline, Single Parenting and the Cost of Living. First Minister. I welcome the report, although I wish it wasn't necessary, uh, because we're all aware of the hardship uh, felt by many families right now, and uh, particularly by single parents. Uh, the Scottish Government's very significant actions to tackle uh, child poverty alongside our interventions uh, to mitigate the cost of living crisis are providing direct support. For example, our five family benefits, which will shortly be worth over £10,000 in the early years of a child's life, include the Scottish Child Payment, which will increase to £25 in November, representing a 150% increase within eight months. Uh, all of this, of course, in contrast to the UK Government, which continues to hold most of the key levers here. Uh, if it reversed the welfare reforms imposed uh, since 2015, such as the two-child limit, the £20 cut to universal credit, the benefit freeze and the benefit cap, this would put £780 million into household uh, budgets and 70,000 people, including 30,000 children, would be lifted 
out of poverty. Uh, unfortunately, we right now have to rely on a UK government to exercise these levers. Um, I look forward to the day uh, when these decisions lie within the powers of this Parliament. Pam Duncan Glancy. I thank the First Minister for that answer and I also thank One Parent Family Scotland and the, the parents who contributed to the report. The report is indeed a grim read and just one parent's response in the report says how bad things are. She says, depression, anxiety, stress. I am responsible for the most amazing children, but I am falling apart. I am terrified of losing my job. The report suggests many ways to tackle child poverty, but including, and crucially, to help people st to stay out of poverty, employability support. So can I ask the First Minister whether she will explore the recommendations set out in the report, and will she give reassurances that the cuts to employability support announced by the Deputy First Minister will not impact efforts to help single parents and other priority groups, including disabled people, larger families, families with children under one, mums who are under 25, and people of colour? First Minister. Uh, yes, I am happy to give those uh, assurances and happy to uh, engage in more detail uh, on all of that. Uh, in terms of the specific questions, yes, we will consider uh, all recommendations in this report. Uh, support for employability is important. In terms of the savings that were announced uh, two uh, weeks ago, of course, the Deputy First Minister set out the rationale for these at a time of uh, very high employment and very low uh, unemployment. Our judgment when our budget is under so much pressure that we need to focus as much as possible in increasing the incomes uh, of people through uh, wage increases uh, as far as we can support those and through, for example, increases to the Scottish Child Payment, uh, but nevertheless supporting employability uh, for lone parents and for others that tend to be furthest from the labour market remains extremely important. We will continue to uh, use all levers uh, and maximise the resources we can bring to bear on tackling poverty generally, child poverty in particular, uh, and uh, in particular the issues experienced by lone parents. I think this government has a good record, uh, but the more powers uh, we hold in our own hands, Hands, the more we're going to be able to do. And Eleanor Whitton. Does the First Minister share my frustration that whilst the Scottish Government introduces significant um, poverty interventions such as the child, a Scottish child payment she's mentioned, our ambition to tackle poverty is not only unmatched, it is absolutely undermined by to Tory policies. Mm -hmm. And that as long as the UK Government holds the key tax, borrowing and welfare powers, we are always going to be constrained in our ability to protect the most vulnerable in our society. First Minister. Yes. I do share that frustration uh, because just as we try to use our powers uh, and deploy our resources to lift people out of poverty. We have a UK government that is taking actions uh, that are pushing people into poverty. Um, that is not a sustainable or a sensible uh, or a morally defensible uh, position. We face a UK government now that seems to want to increase the bonuses paid to bankers uh, while further eroding the incomes of those on universal credit. It is utterly indefensible. I think we are showing what we can do with the limited welfare powers that we have. The Scottish Child Payment is uh, the leading example of that. But for as long as so many of these powers and levers lie with the UK government acting in the way this one is, uh, then our efforts are going to continue to be undermined, which is why it's so important that we get all of these powers into the hands of this parliament as soon as possible. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. The next item of business is a member's debate in the name of Ruth Maguire, and there will be a short suspension to allow those leaving the chamber and public gallery to do so. <laughs>